Everything looks better with a dram in your hand. Hello, and welcome to the Cask 88 Lock-In, week six. What treats do we have in store for you this week? Well, a spotlight on some of Scotland's beloved and most international malts as I talk to the globe-trotting ambassador for Aberfeldy, Altmore, Craig Elohy, the Deveron and Royal Brackler. And the laser-focused ambassador for Balvenie for America's West Coast. Music this week will be soul-enhancing and beautifully skillful, but that's not all the culture that I have for you. Now the Fringe has been cancelled this year, which means I'm not going to be able to put on my performance. So, instead, I will bring exclusively to you my own personally rewritten take on Shakespeare, entitled Dramlet. There's trouble in the Kingdom of Denmark. But now, to our first interview. On with the show. My guest now, Georgie Bell, is Bacardi's global ambassador of single malts and one of the most seasoned travellers around. In a variety of roles, she's often called to hit the trail for over half a year at a time. So, due to this lockdown, she's finally frozen in place long enough for me to catch a quick interview. Georgie Bell, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You've now spent eight uh, or more years in the whiskey industry. Do you reckon you're getting close to that point where you've learned everything there is to know? Absolutely not. I think there's so much to learn within the whiskey industry. Whiskey is evolving. Scotch whiskey evolve it is evolving. When I started out 10 years ago, the whiskey industry wasn't like it is today um, in terms of the way people drink whiskey, in terms of the people involved with it, in terms of the breadth of what's on our shelves. 10 years ago, there was no such thing as a no age statement whiskey. So within Scotch, I think, you know, Obviously, we have the Scotch Whiskey Association laws that we abide by, the regulations, but wild whiskey and the emergence of it is keeping us on our toes so much um, that there's so much innovation happening within Scotch Whiskey that it's very exciting. I'm learning new stuff, honestly, every day from what I'm reading and what I'm tasting um, and new innovations out there, not only in Scotch, but, but across the world. Can you remember what it first was that got you interested in Scotch and made you think, yeah, I could, I could make a career of this? Well, I was living in Edinburgh at the time and I was bartending. Best thing that ever happened to me was getting a job behind the bar. And then I think the moment I realised I was like, oh, I could push this further was when I started working at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. And the time you spent at the SMWS, uh, their focus is very much on the sort of the single cask and how individual each whiskey can be. Uh, do you reckon that's a, a lesson you took strongly to heart? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I learned so much there and I'm still a huge advocate of the SMWS. What that taught me really was that casts are almost like snowflakes in a way. Every single one is different. Once they're gone, they're gone. And I've been able to take a lot of those learnings into future jobs after that. And, at Bacardi, we have an exceptional cask program where we look at single casks, double casks, and small batches of whiskey. So I'm still able to get my kicks of uh, single casks, but without after afterlife of the SMWS. In your role as you know, in a very recognisable role as Bacardi's ambassador of single malts, you have some really recognisable names in your stable: uh, Altmore, Craig Ellicke, the Deveron, and you've been educating people about those. Are you allowed to have a favourite among the malts or are you expected to you know, treat all your children equally? Uh, or do they all have different talents that can be brought out at different times? I think more of the latter, a little bit of the former, but more of the latter in the sense that we're very lucky at Bacardi. We've got five amazing single malts from five different distilleries across the Highlands and in Speyside. And each one of those, there's no real overlap in terms of flavour. Each one of them is quite unique and distinctive with its flavour and also its personality as well and what it brings forth to the glass. So, you know, I look at Abathaldi and I think of big, rich, honeyed notes that come through and a big fruity hit that we get from Abathaldi Distillery. I think of Craig Ellicke and you get that lovely muscular character from the worm tub condensers and oil-fired malt. You then have Altmore that's super 
light and clean and fresh and seen as the top dresser in the blended whiskey world. You put a drop of Altmore into a blend and it just lifts all of those flavors up. Um, you then have Royal Brackler standing proud up near Nairn on the Cordor Estate, where every one of the Royal Bracklers is finished on the Oloroso casks. And then we have the Devrin, which I just like to think of as a warm hug in a mug. So you've got these five completely different whiskies, the five different occasions, five different moods, and five almost different ways of drinking. Yeah, it really must work well that each whiskey so clearly does its own thing. Uh, it just makes it so much easier to love all of them for their own particular uh, particular skills. And particular nuances as well, you could say. Um, I also think occasion plays a big part, and I don't know about you, but my Monday night dram is very different from my Wednesday night dram, which is very different from my Friday night dram. But another thing I wanted to ask about, um, a more recent project starting in 2018, uh, you and Becky Paskin um, started our whiskey. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that, please? Yeah, Becky and I have known each other for a very long time, and we realized within the whiskey industry, it's growing and it's such a burgeoning place to be. And um, sometimes, however, the face of the true whiskey drinker isn't actually represented in what's going out. And, um, you know, I often get us not so much these days but definitely 10 years ago when i first started you drink whiskey but you don't look like you drink you're the type of person to drink whiskey and i think as the world itself has evolved and modernized and um not only gender boundaries have broken but also just general boundaries have broken um the same can be said as to what's been happening to the whiskey drinker Yet for a very long time, it's still been portrayed as as the norm. Um, so we decided to create our whiskey to really combat that and to showcase the modern face of the whiskey drinker and also to educate as well on, on what whiskey can be. Another break with convention um, was uh, part, part of sort of a, uh, a project you did with Craig Ellicky. So we're used to seeing 40 plus year old whiskey treated almost like a holy relic, untouchable, something to be locked away in a glass cabinet and venerated from a distance. And then you took a very different approach with Bar 51. Uh, so tell us a bit more about that, especially for those who sadly missed it. So we found one cask um, from Craig Ellicky that was distilled on the 22nd of December in 1962. Um, and when we found this cask, it was 51 years old. And not only that, but uh, due to the angel share, we're very happy angels, as we like to talk about in Scotland, we were left with just 51 bottles of it. We wanted, as a team with Craig Ellicky 51, to bring whiskey back to what it's all about, which is clinking glasses with friends old and new and enjoying a dram and, and the reason that the team back at the distillery back in 1962 probably made that whiskey which was to be drunk and enjoyed with friends so we decided to go against the norm and create almost the world's most uncollectible collectible whiskey um, and we gave it away for free dram by dram at a series of pop-up events and as someone once said it's probably the most tried 51 year old whiskey ever in the world Alluding to the travel that you used to spend most of your time, well, a good chunk of your time doing at any rate, is there one trip among the many you've taken that was particularly memorable? I really do enjoy spending a lot of time in Scotland. I used to live there. I lived there in Edinburgh for 10 years. I love coming up to Scotland and spending time in the distilleries. I'm a keen cyclist and walker, so any opportunity to actually get up there and be in the fresh air and Last time I went up to Craig Ellicky, we actually went canoeing down the River Spey um, with Dave Craig in the spirit of the Spey Company and we took some of our USA ambassadors on with us and seeing Speyside from the water from the River Spey is something truly, it's really quite special and it just brings it to life in a whole new different way so yeah, I really do enjoy spending time in Scotland. That's the reason we're all in this, right? Because of Scotland and because of the amber nectar that's created there. So 
it's really nice to be able to go back to, to the motherland, as it were. I have to say it's been really wonderful um, to talk with you today. And so if I can raise my glass to celebration and commiseration <laughs> and everything yes. turned out well. Georgie Bell, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Alas, poor Ben Nevis, I drank him, Dave Wilson. A whiskey of lemony zest, reminiscent of the most excellent French fancies. He hath poured me drams of himself a thousand times over, yet how pale in imagination it is. Memories alone cannot raise it. Here, I have hung my lips for kisses I know not how oft. Where be your esters now, your brambles, your dried mangoes, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set my tongue of a roar? Not one now to know thine own emptiness. Quite hollow. Well, get thee to a dunnage chamber, to thine brother casks to say, let them mature a decade, two, three hence, still to this favour they must come. Prithee, Dave Wilson, tell me one thing. Were I to take another bottle of Ben Nevis to me, wouldst thou speak of betrayal? Hmm. And in all this deliberation, I could have had a new bottle a hundred times again. I doth waste time, and now time doth waste me. Enough of this, arrant knave. Get thee to an off-license. I'm joined now by Ryan Young, who is an up-and-coming uh, folk musician from Cardross, just outside Glasgow. He's part of a group of young players who are bringing fresh ideas to traditional Scottish music. His work on the fiddle is not just technically skillful, but also incredibly moving. He's been nominated for numerous BBC Radio Folk Awards and his 2017 debut album was entered into the Grammys. Ryan Young, welcome. Lovely to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. So I'd say your style is quite distinctive. It's got one foot firmly planted in traditional, but you're giving everything a bit of your own spin as well. So how did you develop your style? I, I play a lot of Scottish tunes, mainly Scottish tunes, but um, I grew up listening to Irish fiddle players. A teacher once said that they, they kind of hear me as floating in the middle of the Irish Sea, so somewhere kind of in between the two. <laughs> the two styles of music have kind of influenced each other a lot over the years, so being at that intersection must be really exciting. Yeah, well, um, they share a lot of tunes. A lot of tunes um, have a Scottish name and an Irish name, so both countries would claim them as their own which is a sign of a good tune, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have played, and we'll bring this back to whiskey, because, you know, whiskey shop. Uh, yeah. You played at the uh, the Keepers of the Quaich banquet. So the Keepers of the Quaich yeah. are these, this, this great society whose um, role is to protect and uh, promote Scotch whiskey. And um, part of this is through, um, you know, so the, these dinners, and you've played at one of them. Um, how was it? Um, oh, it's probably it's one of the most amazing things. Um, they have them in Blair Athol Castle, and um, that's kind of there's a very famous portrait of a fiddle player called Neil Gow, who's said to be the father of Scottish fiddle playing, um, and that hangs up in Blair Athol, and one of his fiddles hangs in the wall too. So it's a very kind of special experience, kind of playing in a hall, knowing that Neil Gow would have played there. And then you look up and there's all these kind of famous people looking back at you, just there to appreciate Scottish whiskey and Scottish culture. And yeah, it's just an amazing thing. So the Keepers of the Quake, actually, um, they uh, have a program for young folk musicians and they help support uh, education and training for young uh, folk musicians, which uh, you were the beneficiary of. Um, tell us a little more about that, please. Without it, I couldn't have actually done a master's degree in Scottish music. So it's, I, I totally owe the Keepers of the Quake um, that degree. So it's, without them, I couldn't have done it. It's this lovely sort of 
partnership that whiskey and traditional music seem to have together. And quite a lot of traditional songs have been written with whiskey as the core subject. Mm -hmm. And I understand that um, you've chosen one of these um, whiskey themed songs for us today. Could you tell us a little more about it? Yeah, um, well, I, I found a very, very old tune for you. Um, it was written by a poet called Alexander MacDonald. And um, the title is called In Dispraise of Whiskey. But um, it's it's actually about what he says, a friend and a foe of whiskey having a dialogue. So hopefully the friend wins. I'm sure he does. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, doubtless. Good always triumphs yeah. over evil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ryan Young, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll leave the rest in your very capable hands. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. To suffer the salt and reek of outrageous isla, or to pour drams troubled of seaweeds and by imbibing, sense them. To drink of peat no more, and by a dram to say we end the heartburn and thousand smoky shocks the tongue is heir to, tis a consumption devoutly to be wished. But in that peat of death what drams may come must give us pause. There's the octomore that makes calamity of so long a finish. To grunt and sweat under so smoky a dram, but that the dread of being without a drink, and makes us rather bear the ills we have, than fly to others that peep not at all. Thus conscience makes cowards of us all. For something that started as a small cottage industry, Scotch whisky has seriously outgrown its humble origins. The malts now travel far and wide, accompanied by devoted brand ambassadors. I'm joined now by Neil Strachan, ambassador not just to William Grant & Sons, but to Balveni single malt whisky in particular. And he's ambassador not just to North America, but to the West Coast in particular. This business can get pretty granular. Neil Strachan, welcome. Hey Sam. I would say that the first whiskey that really got me interested in drinking whiskey kind of seriously was one of yours. It was the Balveni 12 year old double cask. And I've talked to a few other people and it seems like my story is not unique. Uh, so what is it about this particular malt that seems to break through people's defenses and get them interested in drinking scotch? For me personally, it was actually the first bottle of whiskey I was ever gifted as my uh, by my sister. So it means quite a lot to me as well. But when I look back to like my days as a bartender in Scotland, the versatility of the 12 double wood makes it such a great, great entry level whiskey that we don't have the same apparency of alcohol that punches you in the face like some single malts do. When it came along, it was quite an innovation, you know, finishing uh, a whiskey in a different cask from what it started was quite a new thing, which I think mean, Balveni was quite ahead on when it introduced it. But then 
you're also very traditional in many ways, keeping the floor maltings. So how do you know when to go boldly into the future and when to hold back and stay traditional? So things like, as you mentioned there, having our own floor maltings allows us to really be able to experiment with different things on smaller batches that distilleries that buy all their malt in industrially will have a really hard time to do. With any experiments, we never look to be too far away from the essence of the distillery itself. And that's something David Stewart's nurtured in his time making the Balvenie, that house style of a honey and vanilla sweetness. It's pretty much lurking any, it's somewhere in a Balvenie, whether it's a 12 to a 50. There's actually quite a few different whiskies in the William Grant and Sons stable, but it seems that each one gets their own brand ambassador in the different regions. So what is it that particularly makes a brand ambassador for Balvenie? So for the Balvenie and really like the distillery as a whole, we have like a overarching kind of theme to how we go about our business. So it basically is, although we take our whiskey exceptionally seriously, we don't take ourselves very seriously. So Sam, in, in terms of innovation, is there anything that I can pass on to David Stewart that you'd like to see the Balvenie do in the future? So there was a, a time a couple of years back, the um, SWA relaxed some of their restrictions on maturation. Not all of them, but sort of there's some new ways that whiskey can explore its relationship with wood. And something outside of whiskey that I quite like is mezcal, smoky cactus juice, uh, kind of like tequila, but a little bit weirder. And that sometimes gets matured in oak casks. Now, if that's possible and legal and of interest to David Stewart, I'd love to try a Balvenie mezcal cask. Sounds like a coming plan for a trip to Mexico to source some casks for David to play with. <laughs> now, the whiskey travels, so wherever you go in the world, that's kind of going to be with you. But is there something from Scotland that you get really homesick about when you're away? Yeah, there's um, what, one, th one thing in particular. I think moving to the West allowed me to do a lot of the things I like doing outdoors. But one thing about Scotland and Speyside in particular is the, the region space I gets its name from the river that runs through, uh, through it and it's equally as famous for salmon fishing and I really miss salmon fishing with the boys spending days and days on the river trying to snaffle a salmon usually to no avail. So clearly you like to sort of get back to nature spend it doesn't matter if you catch a fish or not so, so long as you're out there the question is on these trips which whiskey would be in your hip flask with you? I think if we're out in the wilderness in Scotland, as we know, if we're hiking up in the Cairngorms, the weather can change like that. And it can be, can be the most glorious of days. And then it turns very, very quickly. So if you're anchored up in a Balthay or you're out up in the hills, I think you're needing high ABV. Something just to warm you up from the inside. Something that's going to give you a little bit of bang for buck in your hip flask. So for me on that front, Bob's bottle sitting down here, prepared, ready. Got the 15 year old single barrel. Um, so, and a sherry bomb as well. The Balvenie, majority of her spirit is aged in ex bourbon cask, but that quality really still shines through in sherry casks. And what I love about this whiskey is it's big, you know, those classic bigger sherry notes, those dried fruits, those bigger spice notes. We want to warm you up on those hills. And once this uh, lockdown is all over, what are future plans, both for you and maybe for Balvenie, if you can speak on that? Last year, we uh, released the stories range, showcasing stories from people at the distillery. And what's great about the people at the distillery is, you know, we have, we have individuals that have worked for 63 years at the distillery. The stories that come with that are priceless. We released three bottles last year. The, the new one, uh, the Edge of Burnt Head Wood, was just released last week. Uh, and that's a Balvenie that uses heather to dry the barley. And really, it's going to be an exciting time to find these stories and find the liquid and give it to you guys out there to taste. So yeah, it's, I'm very, very excited about how that's going to develop. Not content to keep running in place, Balvenie sort of charging forward. And I'm really excited to see what comes of it. So are we. 
So are we. <laughs> well, I've got to say, uh, it's been absolutely lovely. Neil Strachan, thank you so much for joining us uh, this well afternoon for us, morning for you. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. It's good. It gets me out of my bed and dressed <laughs> nice and early, ready for the day ahead. And there we are, an exceptionally cultural and classy episode all around. Please do like, comment and subscribe, otherwise you are uncultured and boorish and should probably just watch a rerun of Celebrity Love Island instead. Shots fired. Before we go, I have two announcements. First, from this point on we are becoming a twice monthly show. Because this much intensely awesome content every week is a bit more than the amount recommended by the WHO. So from now on, the next episode will be out on the 3rd of June, which is of course irrelevant to anyone who's watching this in the future. Second, and I'd like to be more serious for a moment, though sales of whiskey are doing well despite the lockdown, selling casks and bottles is only a small part of this industry. A lot of the drinks industry is based on hospitality, serving customers and welcoming visitors, and it's this area that's been hit incredibly hard. Now, established in 1886, the Drinks Trust is a group set up to assist people working in the drinks industry during times of hardship, and their commitment to that goal is being tested now like never before. For every episode that Cask 88 are putting out, we're making a donation to the Drinks Trust, and we encourage you that if you have a spare thought or coin for them, visit the link at the bottom of this page and see what you can do as well. Now, I'll leave you with the final exciting act of Dramlet. Goodbye, everybody. Have a lovely week. It is the Iced Cup. Oh, the drink, the drink. Oh, oh, dear Dramlet, the drink. I am poisoned. Ugh. Dramlet, Dramlet, you're dead. No medicine in the world can save you. The treacherous weapon lies right in your hand. Cold and diluted poison. The foul ice cube freezes my malt. Here I lie, and shall not get up again. My whiskey's been chilled. I can no longer speak. The ice cube, the ice cube's to blame. Oh. No Perrier.